Greetings, cocksuckers. It's December 16th. Welcome to Podcastville. It's the church of what's happening now. Brought to you by Netflix new podcast, Behind Behind the Irishman. I've told you about the Irishman on Netflix. I enjoy it. I don't give a fuck about the three hours and 49 minutes. It's tremendous. <laughs> now you can hear all about it, how it was made into an official podcast with my main man, Sebastian Maniscalco. The Irishman has De Niro. It has Pacino. It's got Joe Pesci. And, again, Sebastian Maniscalco. All three episodes are out right now. Today, Monday, spoiler alert. Watch The Irishman on Netflix before you listen to the podcast. Search for Behind the Irishman wherever else you listen to podcasts. Watch the movie, then go to Behind the Irishman. The church is also brought to you by, and I'm hooking you up. I think like fucking Thursday or Friday is the last day you can order a gift and get it because Amazon or wherever the fuck they live is going to shut you down. But listen, <laughs> you're sitting there right now. It's Monday morning. You're like, what am I going to get my uncle? For fucking Christmas. And then picture your uncle <laughs> and ask yourself, does his asshole stink like fucking death? It probably does. He's a truck driver. He gets in and out. He drinks a lot of coffee. He's fucked up. That's where Hello Tushy comes in. You're like, Joey, what's Hello Tushy? Hello Tushy is a portable bidet that takes you 10 minutes to install. And it sprinkles your ass with fresh, refreshing fucking water. No more paper. No more cutting down trees. No more killing the apocalyptos. You know how many apocalyptos you fucking kill every time you wipe your ass? There's 10 dead Indians because who knows how the fuck they got the tree paper. I don't fucking know. A bidet saves you money on toilet paper. And the tushy sprays your ass with fresh water. Not toilet water, all right? Tushy connects to the water supply behind your toilet to spray your fucking asshole in the back back of your nutsack. Or oh, ladies, you got to get the back of that monkey. Sometimes that asshole juice dips into the bottom. You got to catch that shit before it starts. So do me a favor. They start at $79. Go to hellotushy.com slash church and get 10% off your order. Kick this motherfucking muley. It's Monday morning. Anyway, what's happening, you bad motherfuckers? I got myself. I got Jesus Trejo and my main man, the Christ killer in the fucking house. What's happening? Jesus? What's up, you guys? Thank you guys for having me again. This Absolutely. Is, this is a blessing, man. We had a good time on uh, Friday. We shot a we little did, fucking man. video and we laughed our asses off. You're a riot, Joey. Oh, we're, we're riot mean, together. We fucking oh, just. Oh, man. I like going off anymore. <laughs> I don't like just playing comedy no more. This, my life ain't no right. Saturday Night Live edition. That's the worst <laughs> fucking show on television. I swear to fucking God. It's not worth it. If that. you watch Saturday Night Live, shoot yourself. If you wake up, if you go to work on Mondays and tell your friends, how good is Alec Baldwin this weekend? Take a fucking black cock and shove it up your ass. It's over. <laughs> You're a dumb fuck, okay? I fucking hate you saying that live, people. I have for a long fucking time. I'm happy. It's the holiday season. I feel honest. It's like a week away from Hanukkah. I can't, you know. Right? You're like a week away from Hanukkah. I honestly don't know when it is this year. It changes every year. It's like the 27th, 26th, nice. something. Maybe the 20th. Who cares? Who gives a fuck? But we're close. We're close. That's all that matters. Yeah. Polish that beanie. <laughs> Polish that beanie. Nice. It's holiday season. Forgiveness. What's this fucking? What's Hanukkah? Oh, we're just happy that the oil lasted for eight days instead of one. We just want presents. Okay. That's it, man. It's It's not as good as Christmas, though. (laughs) It sucks compared to Christmas. What's going on with you, Hazel's Trail? Chilling, man. I'm just... Specials at Showtime. Yeah, man. Midnight spots at the store. You're like a regular fucking... Yeah, man. I'm just happy, man. I'm just happy to be able to, you know, do my thing, do comedy. Things are looking up. You know, just a blessing, man. it, it, It beats pushing a lawnmower. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's like, hey, man, I'm, I've, I've been able to kind of, you know, make a living from from my uh, IP, intellectual property. You know what I mean? Just think about something and manifest it, make it happen. You, you were know? talking about the fields earlier. Yeah, man. Talk to me. It's crazy. I mean, you're out there working. I mean, I, I remember going out there working this with is my in dad. Mexico or No, here? no, here. I'm born and raised here. Okay. Uh, I'm born and raised here in Long Beach, California. But, you know, my parents came from Mexico. And uh, yeah, my dad's from Sinaloa, and uh, my mom's from Jalisco. So I mean, I pretty much had the upbringing of a <laughs> of a of an immigrant, you know. Uh, Spanish, my first language. I didn't have command of English to like what fifth grade, because I could I could speak English, but it's like it still was a little rough, you know. You just kind of figure it out. So you just kind of learn English translating for your <clears throat> folks, you know. In the morning before we went out to go work, we'd go to a donut shop or. 
Seven Eleven, and I order everything for my dad or for the guys he was he brought to work with him. And then you know we drink coffee, laugh it up. It's about to be seven a.m. That's when you can start. That's it when it was the, your father's company. Yeah, it's a landscaping business. Oh, so it was a landscape. Yeah, business. it was. So how do yeah, you we were like gardeners and fucking stuff. cherries or something. Like that. Oh no, no, yeah. No, I, I mean, we did a little bit of that, like you know, taking out grass, putting out sod, you know, taking trees out. So we like we would work the fields as far as like planting stuff. And how know, old are you now? Thirty three. Do you think about that work ethic when you're doing comedy? Like, do you? Yeah. Oh yeah, man. I'm I'm so grateful. My dad was a hard ass. Tough love all day. The definition of tough love, you type it in, my dad comes out arms folded, you know? And thanks to that, I think I was able to apply it to to comedy. You know? It's like if I was able to be out there and working with my dad twelve hours, no problem. You know, we just stop for water breaks, eat, listen to the radio in between spots. If I could do that, I could I could yeah, I could go on the road. I could do this. I could do that. I am i don't stop. Even to a fault. I mean, we were talking about this earlier, how sometimes you're like, man, I need a break today. Like, I just need to sleep in a little bit. And, yeah, I've been able to transfer that into comedy. And it's just been, you know, it's been a blessing that I can multitask that way and not feel the fatigue. What's the dude who walks on charcoals and shit? The dudes that walk on isn't charcoal. Isn't that Tony Robbins? Yeah, Tony Robbins, for example. Uh-huh. You go to a Tony Robbins seminar. He, he speaks about triggers for performance, you know. And it's so weird, like, I have a problem. You know, we all have insecurities, and we doubt ourselves. I have a lot of doubt. And even, you know, before you go on stage, you have a little insecurity, you know, just little right. touches. And I think that... One of the triggers, one of the jobs that I always go back to is hot carry. Hot like carry. For a minute, when you work for a, a cement guy that builds Oh, bricks, okay. Uh-huh. You know, like, your shirt's off. Right. You could taste the salt from your body on your, uh, the, on your, the you sweat know, your skin. Dripping. Like, you've been sweating since 9.15, and it's 4 o'clock. And you don't give a fuck. You're outside. You're picking up bricks. Mm-hmm. You're mixing mortar. And it's easy. It's hard. But at the same time, you just enjoy what you're doing, that it's easy. Right. And I compare that before I walk on stage sometimes. Like, I think of all these things. Like, I'm so petrified before I go on stage. So that's why I was asking you, how is working that field, that immigrant mentality, helped your comedy? I mean, last night you did five spots. Yeah, easy. Five fucking spots. People go move to New York to do five spots in a night. And just to be clear, I mean, these spots weren't, like, packed with people. I mean, there was just a No, they never are. Yeah, they never are. They never are. Uh, One of them was uh, the Ice House was packed, but, you know, it's great. I I think just that mentality, it's like, you know, just moving forward and not being phased because it's like I know know what it's like to have to go to work with your dad and be sick. You know, it's like you have the flu or you have this or you have a headache. It's like, it don't matter. It don't don't matter, matter. man. It doesn't matter. My dad had to go to work no matter what. It doesn't matter. That's what people don't understand that we've become very pussified, you know. I'm pussified. You're sick, come on down. Right. Puke here and then go back home. Then we're cool. I was raised under that mentality. You know, I pulled my hamstring. For the first week, I didn't do nothing. Then after that, I knew I got two options. This thing could curl in me, uh-huh. and I could sit here, and I got an excuse not to work sure. out. Or I could work around it. Yeah, do other things the first two or do. three days, I was very scared, mm-hmm. you know. And then I realized you have to give the leg like, blood for it to heal, you know. Like, you have to. It's so weird how the show must go on. You don't have time to bleed, you know. I tell people that me and Rogan really have nothing in common except for one thing. And it's, it builds our bond so much, and that's called the religion of comedy. Religion of comedy, I'm a yeah. Catholic, yeah, and I'm a Santeria guy, and I believe right. in Buddha beliefs, but I was raised. When did you start comedy? There's two questions I have for you, right? Okay. Don't answer them. When did you start comedy, and when did you start doing comedy? There's always two questions. Right. There's always two dates. For me, I started comedy July of 91. When did I really start comedy? When did the religion sink in? And I was like, this is it. That's a great question. Rain, snow, shine, right. birthdays, anniversaries, right. no weddings. Yeah, I'm man. selling every possession I got. 
mm -hmm. just to fucking force, because this is what I want to do. Yeah. I started yeah. comedy July of 91. I started doing stand-up October of 93. Right. That's when I go, okay, I'm, I just got, I baptized myself. Right. And I'm in the religion of comedy. What does that mean that nothing else matters? Everything is revolved. Comedy is first. Cocaine was a tight second. <laughs> and neck and neck. Pussy was a tight third. <laughs> you know, but the comedy of religion, mm. the religion of comedy was first. That was it. I drove to wherever I had to go, I, whatever hustle I had to do. When would, when did it snap for you? So I'm 33 now. I started comedy when I was uh, 20, right? So I had just turned 20. Like, um, I went out for the first time when I was 20, right? Kind of did it, bombed my ass off real bad. Got scared, didn't do it for a whole year. And I came back at 21 because that's when I can get into the bar illegally. And I go up there and I bombed harder than the first time. I'm like, fuck all this shit. I'm going to stick with school. You know, I think my dad's onto something with this school shit. You so, were going to college. Yeah, yeah. I was going to college. I ended up graduating. But I remember even when I graduated, I grabbed my diploma, gave it to my folks. I'm like, <coughs> this is for you. I'm going to go park cars. And my dad threw a fit. He's like, if, if that's what you wanted to do, he's like, why the fuck are you wasting time and money? It's like you're you're gonna all my sacrifice. You're gonna go park cars at the store. Why did you want to park cars at the store? Because I could get stage time, and I wanted to get passed. And that's how Mitzi had the system in play. You know, you do uh, potluck, which back then was Sunday and Monday. So if you got Sunday, you weren't gonna get up Monday. So that freed up my Monday. I could do another open mic. But you do the open mic until you're basically tapped. And they're like, Hey, do you want to work here? Fuck yeah, I do want to work here. And that meant I had a guaranteed spot on potluck Sunday and Monday now, right? And that was three minutes of stage time. That's six minutes between the two. And then you get one development spot in the belly room. That's another three. I'm up to nine minutes. Maybe run the light every once in a while. That's 10 minutes. You feel me? A week? Sign me in. So I worked the store. You know, I hung out for a year begging Tommy to let me work there. I mean, begging. Hey, Tommy. Hey, Tommy. And as soon as I was coming up the stairs, Tommy was like, oh, well, I know I know what you're going to say. I'm going to tell you the same thing I told you yesterday. Hey, just putting it out there, man. I was annoying. I've never been that annoying with anything in my life. But when you want to get into the religion of comedy, that's what it takes, you know? Why did you want to do it so bad? You wanted to be around it 24-7. You wanted to chew it, live it, spit it. It was, it was, it, it was what I wanted to do. And then, like, the just the track record of the comedy store, I mean... You know, some of the guys who I looked up to came out of the comedy store. It's like you have Richard Pryor coming out of there and then somebody who I became enamored with. And I never got to me, but God rest his soul, Freddie Soto. I'm like, I identified so much with Freddie Soto. It's like, well, where did he come out of the comedy store? Well, what did he do? He drove Richard Pryor around and he worked the store. Yeah, that's where I needed to be. You know, you have Jim Carrey coming out of there, Sam Kennison. Um I mean, the list goes on and on. It's like, it's all day. And I was like, I, I, I need to get in there. You know, Rogan was there. Shafir was there. You're there. It's like, it's tried and true. I need to get in, you know, and I got in and I did it. I did every job. I parked cars for a long time. I uh, did maintenance work during the day. I unclogged the toilets. How long did it take you to get past? Uh, a little over two years. So no it's like in, shit. In under, in under three years. Good for you. Yeah, That's so good. I started when I was 20, but I started started comedy September 7, 2012. That's when I got past. And I knew that that's when it started because I was on the road. I was on the road. I was I was on the road. I, I, I think I was in uh, Chicago. We were driving cr cross country, me and my homie uh, Kyle Ray. And um, we were just driving across town. We had a gig in Des Moines, Iowa at the Funny Bone, and then we had a gig at uh, uh, Pittsburgh Improv, right? And they were a week apart. So it was this week at Des Moines, a week in the middle, free, and then the following week, it was Pittsburgh. So we drove. It took us a month to go there and back. So we do we do uh, Des Moines. Uh, uh, we were opening for Steve Torino, and uh, we drive to Iowa. We do the show. Then we go to Chicago, and we stay there for a whole week, and we're sleeping in the car one of the best times of our lives. We're sleeping in the car, eating fucking gas station hot dogs and coffee in the morning, splitting a, a, a 
pack of donuts here and there, buying, you know, gas station bananas just to eat healthy, you know. <laughs> and then so we do uh, Pittsburgh. And then on the way back, we're in Chicago. And I remember this. We were at a coffee shop at a Borders bookstore at some mall. Who knows where? I couldn't tell you. And the names go up. And um, I think it was uh, maybe Brenton who sent a picture of them painting my name on the wall because I already got passed, right? So they're painting the names on the wall. And I couldn't be there for the names night ceremony. And I was bummed out. I was like, fuck, man. I'm on the road doing, you know, open mics in Chicago in between, just kind of waiting for the gig because I was so bummed out. And um, and again, Kyle was like, this is what you want to be doing. I was like, you want to be a comic, right? I said, yeah. And, then, you know, started thinking about it. It's like, this uh, if, I, if I really want to be a comic, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. I'm on the road doing comedy as opposed to being in town at the store and seeing my name go up. I got a picture of my name half written on the wall. And I was like, all right. That night we went to downtown Chicago and we did some some show at a bar that I ate shit at. But I got off stage feeling great. I'm like, wow, they have no idea. Like I just started comedy right now. Like this is this is the day. And yeah, to answer your question, it was September seventh, two thousand twelve. That's crazy. Twelve year difference of thinking of procrastinating. But you started at the store in two thousand nine. Yeah, yeah. Um that's what, yeah, that, that's around when I started. I don't know exactly when I started, but I was doing open mics in Long Beach. Uh, I was driving back and forth, you know, just, you know, I was working. I was working jobs here and there. I was working at a steel factory. I was working retail. I was working like whatever I could get my hands on, working with my dad on weekends. But during the week, it, it, and, and then eventually I, I got a job as an ABA instructor. I was working with autistic kids ages three to seven. I was going to school. I was like essentially hands on teaching, you know. And I would get out at 5.30 or 6 o'clock. That's peak traffic hours here in L.A. So it would take me, if I got out at 5, it would take me damn near two hours to get to the store. But that's where I needed to go, to go do my spots. Then I'm working there at the store. And I remember during those times, Chappelle was popping in. So it would go late. We were there at 3, 4 in the morning. I got to drive home, sleep, be at school at 7 in the morning and do it again. And it was those weeks where he would pop in multiple times. Where I'm like, this is just what it is. I remember one time uh, Don Barris caught me sleeping in his car. I moved his car because I'm moving cars around. And he had the heaters on and it was cold. I just stood there and I was like knocked out. He opens the door. He's like, what the fuck are you doing? Sleeping in my car. I was like, oh, my bad, my bad. <laughs> Let me go sit in my car. But I mean. What makes us do that? Crazy the hustle? Shit. You know, there, there's the something bigger. The What makes you, what possesses somebody? To, look, if I go home and my door doesn't work. Like I go to turn the key, and right. my key breaks in the door. That's one thing. I know I gotta sleep in my car. Right. But you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. Fuck. <laughs> fuck. You call the locksmith. He wants eight hundred because it's two thirty in the morning. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but now the landlord, you know, you get him at eight. So what do you do? You crawl in your car. You right. put your hooded sweatshirt Dug on. You go to sleep. What we know, okay. So you get pissed off for eight minutes. Right. You put the music on the heater and you pass out. What makes you get in the car knowing you're going to sleep at a truck station and some chick is going to come up to you, some chubby chick at four in the morning, knock on your glass and go, are you looking for a date? And you're like, not really. <laughs> you filthy the animal and there's a bunch of guys shooting meth. I mean, when I used to pull into those truck stops, they were crazy. Really? And I would have a knife. What's the name of that uh, truck stop? I, I don't think we stopped there. I, yeah, well, no, I, mean, you know, I mean, you name it. You, know, yeah. you name it. You know, I mean, you go to some truck stops and see gay activity, like a guy going into the bathroom and then like a guy going in and walking out, but that guy's still in there and another guy going out and that guy's still in there and another guy going out and you're like, wow. And you're there rolling like your joints. That's a for different the next... kind of bathroom attendant. Right yeah, there. like you're rolling your joints and you have a box of chains so you could get like a, what are those fucking chips that are like a cone? Oh, bugles? Bugles. Uh -huh. know, like I still remember living off of bugles. Really? And like Subway veggie and cheese. Like <laughs> It's so funny. It's like... so fucking crazy. Like what makes you, I've asked the last three comics that have come on here. Like ever since. I can answer that question for sure. And it's it's knowing that there's there's this book by David Lynch. And I don't remember the exact title, but it's like Finding the Big Fish 
or catching the big fish. And it's just the thought, you know, you let all these little fishes go by. It's like you're fishing, you catch one, you let it go. And that's a day job. It's this opportunity. It's an office job. Yeah, I mean, you let all those fishes go because you know there's a big fish coming. And that's comedy. And for me, seeing guys like you, Rogan, you, you know, look at Delia, Brandon Schaub, like Theo Vaughn. You guys caught the big fish. And I know that. Yeah, you know I mean, it's like, and I know that they're. How did we catch the big fish? Because you guys are doing what you love on your own terms. That's the big fish. You guys are doing comedy. You guys are doing what seems right to you. Yeah, you know I mean, look at your podcast, how amazing this is. Yeah, you know I mean, I'm, I'm blessed that this is my second time here. The first time I was on here, your audience was so warm. No, they're very warm. They're receptive. On Twitter, they're like, welcome to the they church. Like welcome to the work. church. They believe in all Bro, this shit. This is our thing. You get to create. This is our thing. People are on your wavelength. Nobody's telling you, hey, Joey, uh, the sponsors thing, you can't read it like that. No. We're, they're happy to do business with you. They're happy to listen to you week after week. You caught the big fish. You have a wife. You have a kid. You have a family. But do these things just happen? Are they luck? No. Are they persistence? You know, I believe in the universe. And I believe the universe has a set a certain strength. Mm -hmm. And I believe that if the universe sees that you're really fucking suffering, you know, but you're not bitching. You know, the universe hurts. Perspective. The universe hates crybabies, bro. Right. And guess what? I was the biggest crybaby of them all because I know what it is to be in love. I know what it is to break up with somebody. I know I know what it is to be cheated on and those feelings you get. In nineteen ninety four, mm -hmm. I fell in love with comedy so hard, like nothing else mattered. Right. Like you fall like it's like falling in love with a woman, you know. I was watching the when you watch the Motley Crue movie, he talks about falling in love and it gave him a warmth that he never had growing up and that woman was called heroin. For me, it was cocaine. Right. But the real true addiction was the love I had for comedy. Not to right. be a comedy star, not to even live in L.A., just to be good. Right. Just to be a good comedian. I didn't know what time was. I didn't know what time limits were. Hours, 45 minutes. I didn't know. Right. I didn't care about all that shit. When most people, it, it's really weird when you're 16 and you find your mother on the floor and there's no one, you're the only person that has to take care of you. You learn real quick what things you need to drop from your life for you to survive. Yeah, like there was no more football on Sundays. Uh -huh. There was, you know, when I got to high school, I did the thing that I hated. I did the thing that was uncool to do in the seventies. The most uncool thing you could do in the seventies. What labeled you a loser more than putting a tattoo on your forehead that said "loser" was quitting high school. And because of my mother's death, and because of various other things, I quit high school. Yeah, and it was fucking painful. You know what I'm saying when. When you're already tagged to be a loser, like people who quit high school were losers. Or, not necessarily, their parents had a business mm -hmm. and they were getting groomed to take over the business when they're 40. You're still a fucking moron, you know what I'm saying, for quitting yeah. school. But, uh, but pain, I think, makes a thing called, it's like situations like the one you described gives you a sense of urgency that I think people don't really move with. And, you know, we've talked about my parents' health and stuff. From a very young age, I figured out that, hey, man, this is going to be different. I, I, I can't be up playing video games. I can't, you know, do this and that. I can't be hanging out. I can't, you know, you sacrifice because you know that if there's going to be some kind of relief to the, if you're going to stop the pain somehow, it's going to be through hard work. And that's what you figured out. And I, I think a lot of people have figured out when you find the thing that you love to do, and then you, you know that that thing's going to provide for your loved ones, most importantly. And then you can get a little kickback from that, too. It's like, great. You know, I came here with a lot of people. And 50% of these people are still here today. And I look at what they're doing, and I look at what I'm doing. 
and I'm not here to judge nobody, but I see the differences in career paths. And I question, you know, like it makes me feel shitty, but I question what path that we take that we ended up in different paths, you know, like, you know, why am I still at the comedy store when most of the guys I got put up with aren't even allowed on Sunset? <laughs> the guys I got passed with, like, mm -hmm. they're not even allowed on Sunset. I don't even think they're doing comedy. Right. One guy I know for sure is in and out of a fucking cuckoo farm. That same night I got passed, he's in and out of a fucking insane asylum right now. Right. Comedy just ate him up and chewed him up and spit him out. <laughs> every one, every 90 days you see him on Facebook, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> and he draws a picture of a guy with a missing leg or something. Mm -hmm. But it's just like it, it. you feel guilty. You said a name, you know, Freddie. I was there with Freddie, you know. Wow. I was trying to find my identity, and I saw Freddie go from driver to being on tour with everybody, you know, with right. Carlos and then doing his own tour. And right. then I still remember, remember being at the Houston Comedy Festival with him and him being on the floor under mine and, and fucking, it was all hell down there, mm -hmm. you know. And That's fine. It's, uh, I think about Freddie from time to time. I see Corey now a lot. Yeah. Corey's been up there shaking those titties. <laughs> so, you know, 15 years later, you got to come out and shake those titties. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was He's dead say, and buried. <sighs> Do you struggle with the, like, the sur survivor's remorse? Or I don't know what you call it, survivor's guilt of, of sorts. Like, I, you, you were kind of touching on that. It's like guys who you started with or got passed with. And I, is that something you struggle with? Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's luck. I don't know what I did right because I did everything wrong. But you see, I did everything wrong, but I did one thing right. I put my head down mm -hmm. and I kept going. I kept going. I never gave up. And right. uh, every year I added to my arsenal. I saw what people weren't doing and I tried to add to my arsenal. Early on, I knew I wasn't going to beat Louis C.K. They were not going to let me be Louis C.K. And I wasn't going to let myself be Louis C.K. Sure. Like, not by taking my dick out. I mean, on the talent level, like, yeah. you know, the addiction problems I had wasn't going to let me be Louis C.K. But I kept showing up at the store, following Mooney every night. I didn't give a fuck about that. I didn't. When I was following Mooney all those years and going to Felipe's and all those guys' rooms and ending up at the store, I wasn't thinking of doing theaters on the weekend. I just want to be funny. Right. That's where people get lost. They start looking past that. Right. And your goal is just shut your fucking... Do, do me a favor. Just shut the fuck up. Just shut the fuck up. Until you do halftime of a Buffalo Sabre game, until that time, don't say a fucking word because you don't know dick. And that's where I would go down to the store early and the guys that weren't getting up it's this negative, it's it's negative and it's a reverse guilt that you're on and they're not on. Well, you, 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 Mitzi likes you. Yeah, what do you want me to do? Yeah. Are you insinuating that I fucked her and ate her ass? No, I didn't. I come here on Sundays and I make sure on Sundays my game is on top because right. she's in here. See, in the old days, she would come in during the week. Wow. They would tell you, like, when you got there at nine, like, Mitzi's coming. Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. You know? Yeah. And then she'd sit there, and you're like, thank God, please. And you would actually get people to go talk to her. Yeah. Do me a favor. Go talk to her. Mitzi's giving away spots. Go talk to her. I would trick people to go and talk to her, like, when I was on stage. <laughs> <laughs> Mitzi's looking for somebody from La Jolla. Go talk to her. <laughs> Well, that's what you do. And yeah. when you wanted her to see somebody, you stood next to her and body blocked her. Hi, Mitch, get the fuck out of here. You know what I'm saying? Go take a fucking hike. You're in no danger getting a spot. <laughs> Mitzi will die before she gives you a spot in this fucking dump. You know what I'm saying? Like, they that's were just, great. whenever she was there, she created this fucking energy and they were coming from all over the place. So when, you know, th think about a fucking, think about. Parking cars. Right. Mitzi comes in at 9.30 uh -huh. on a Tuesday. And at 9.45, there's no comedians in the building. 
Oh, shit. And she's sitting in there. She's like, ah, bring me water. Pick my feet up, you know. And she, people are picking a little, <laughs> a little Jewish feet up and shit and put it on the stool. Yeah. And she sits back. <laughs> There's nobody there. It's 945. There ain't nobody there oh, to talk to her. Shit. And she watches your whole set. And you die a death of fucking... 10 Katrina survivors. Like you, you die like one of those fags in Orlando. You just get you just get fucking shot in the head, dog. Oh, and you walk man. off that stage. Remember how I said that you wouldn't even want to, you would just look at the carpet yeah, and, just look and walk out and go, looks like I'll be parking cars for a long fucking time. I better get used to it. Yeah. I better learn how to drive a Tesla. <laughs> because I tell people all the time, I used to leave there going, with tears. I still remember going yeah. down that hill to Fountain mm -hmm. and making that left turn. And down and on La Cienega. Yeah, the tear just going down my face. Like, looks like I won't be at the store no more. It have, goes. Have they ever unpassed somebody? Like, painted over their name on the wall? Or no? I, I saw think. her throw a few people out of there. Ooh. I knew she threw Jerry Seinfeld out of there. Really? Yeah. And he was on there last week. He yeah. came to the store. Yeah, yeah. He came again. I remember the time. Uh, he came in and he told his story on stage. You know, this is maybe a few years ago, but it was like you know, thirty years ago. Just he came, he came to L.A. He was too polished for her. Yeah, that's what it was. He yeah, was too polished for her. She didn't want you polished. Jesus. He basically quoted her and said that it's like you know, you come here to L.A. And he's like, and no one's gonna, no one has told you no. He's like, I want to be that person to tell you no. And he's like, and he would drive down Doheny. In his Porsche, and she would be out there watering the lawn, and they just kind of lock eyes. He's like, but she never would let him play. And then, you know, this was a few years ago, and he went on stage. He's like, this is my first time in a long time. Crazy. And now he went up recently, actually, uh, within a week, right? Fucking Jews hating Jews. It's it's a horror. <laughs> it's a fucking horror show. Do you think it. Mitzi's like strong aura built better comics at the store? It was it it, it was that fear of. I better not bomb. Yeah. No other club had that. I mean, Bud Freeman no. wasn't doing that to comics, no. right? Bud Freeman was out there with his fucking monocle, <laughs> eating dinner with you know, <laughs> 10 people, not bothering anybody. I'll never forget being in Miami, and Bud Freeman was talking to one of the owners. His uh, name was Stan. And this had to be 99. I walk in. I covered for somebody. They, they got canceled, and I was the feature, and I could cover. I would sell tickets down there. That uh -huh. I had, like, a little light, like, from doing feature work. People would come, and they knew I snorted coke. And I'll never forget that Bud Friedman looked at me. He was standing right next to Stan. He goes, hey, look who it is. And he goes, what's this kid's name again? Uh -huh. you know, like, you know, and those are the things you really can't explain to people. Right. Like, you feel like going, go fuck yourself, but you're like, I'm working. I'm getting 1,200. You know what I'm saying? Right. I can't blow this. This is the biggest paycheck I'll ever see in my life. You know? Right, right, right. That's so funny, man. Yeah, the store is such a, like, I've, I mean, you've been there longer than I have and seen the transformation, but there's something very special about that place, you know? I, I have become a I've... different person. I have a loyalty problem. If you did something for me substantial, substantial at some point, my inner... Catholic, Cuban, Indian roots make me very loyal to you. I call, I call certain people who were there certain parts of my life, and I tell them whenever something good happens because I didn't want to let them down. They were there for me. They covered me at a certain spot in my life. In my life, I have a teacher named Mr. T. I call him first. He was my fucking you know, sophomore year teacher. Hmm. I took him to the premiere of fucking something I did, you know, and I think The Longest Yard. I mean, he was such an impact on me comic-wise. comic, mm -hmm. comic -wise. But there's always been, I say about 12 people, Jim Handy, he got me into comedy. He was a car manager at a car place. That's great. You know, all those people, I try to call them when something good happens because in the back of my mind, I'm doing something good for them. I want them to be proud of me. I don't give a fuck about anybody else. I don't give a fuck about the Joneses. Right. I want them to know what they did for me. It was not in vain. Yeah. I want them to know. And when Mitzi died, you know, it was like Mitzi and Brody, and it was just like a weird thing. Yeah. But it was 
It was three deaths. Let's be honest. It was the death of me on Netflix. No. <laughs> no, the death of Mitzi and then the death of Brody. <laughs> oh. It was three deaths. And I say it how it is. I, I, I tell you how it is. I was there. I know how I felt when I got off that stage. You know, whatever. I don't care if Netflix is never going to use me again. But it was three deaths in one. But Mitzi's death affected me. Yeah. Because I re- after she died, I didn't go to a funeral. I didn't want to be around all that. But I did think about what she meant to me. And I said, wow. She changed my whole life because of the store. I, I, I mean, I could take it this deep because of the store. I have a daughter. Mm. I mean, I met my wife at the store. I met Joe Rogan at the store. Right. I met Ari at the store. I met Paul Mooney at the store. I met Eddie Griffin at the store. Right. You know, uh, not to insult anybody, the night I saw you, and we had a really good time at the improv a couple of weeks ago, the first time you were hosting. That's the first time I stepped out of the store in a year. Wow. Because after Mitzi died and after my death on Netflix, R.I.P. I fucking <laughs> <laughs> This is how this is how you have to be though. You have right, to yeah. be able to laugh. You can't live forever thinking that you're a fucking uh, you know, the uh fucking Johnny funny. You know <laughs> I I'm a I'm a special bomber. I bomb on specials, <sighs> but I kill at the original room. You know what I'm saying? Devastate. Like, yeah. The original room, I'll shoot you down, but I bomb on specials. That's my thing. But it's, <laughs> that's my thing. Some people, next time I shoot a special, I got to call a bomb alert. And have like three Iranians there with long beards and shit and fucking giving out hummus chips and shit so they could get the blame. But Mitzi's death fucked me up. Yeah. Because I realized what she had done to me, her Sunday night talks. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I was the host. So in between, I would have to go with, uh, with the list and go, do you want Hayes to go on? God, no. <laughs> you know, she right. would say, I don't want three Schwarzes in a row. Like, I don't want three black guys in a row or three Mexicans in a row. Wow. So I would change it up with her. You know, I don't want three pieces of pussy. This girl's too pretty. Put her up at the end. Like, she just had the science. Right. She just had science. Like, she had done it all before. Like, right, just right, trust right. what I'm saying to you. You know, and every once in a while, I'm not going to lie to you. Next week, I want you to dress like Fidel Castro and put a handcuff on. <laughs> See you next Sunday. You're like, She'd forget shit. by Wednesday. Oh, okay. I you know what I'm saying? Say like, shit. I want you to do Latino night and dress up like Ricky Ricardo and get a blonde and shake her ass and spank it. You know, because she was crazy. You know what I'm saying? Every once in a while she had, but every once in a while she would just say, next time you say that joke, say that word, even if it's offensive. Like shit like that. Like, fuck them. Wow. And you're like, really? And she goes, yeah, that's the word that's needed there. Why pussy the joke up? Right. And I would go, wow. You know what she called my wife? The farmer girl. She called girl. my wife the farmer girl, and she called me. Why she fat, do that? Because she was a farmer girl like me, that tough, and she called me fat wow. baby, fat baby. And then she put my name on the list as fat baby. Oh. I still have the schedules. In my <laughs> so house. you got brought up as fat baby, fat baby. Wow. So she brought me up. As, <laughs> wow. They didn't bring me up as fat baby. They brought me up as Joey Diaz, but nobody would know who I was in those days. So she's like, his name is Fat Baby on the schedule. So it was a fat baby on the schedule. <laughs> when did you fully ditch the fat baby? Like how long before? When she stopped coming around. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Once she That's went, when the name took a death. You're like, ah, oh, like it just went away. I didn't give a fuck. Yeah. I didn't give a fuck. Listen. Call me spick niggified fucking whatever. Right. As long as you give me six parts a week at the comedy store. Right. Remember, at this time, I didn't go to Montreal. Right. I had fucking Shamook. His son and his grandfather is an agent. You know, I had fucking Johnny Rotten as a manager. Nobody talked to me. Nobody booked me for anything. That's why I started doing movies. Mm. Because they said, I'll figure out going through the back door. You look at my IMDb, it's like I got like a 6,000. I'm impeccable on my IMDb. I've been shooting shit since 2003 and never right. stopped. What gave you the foresight or what, what let you know that that was like the, I guess, backdoor way in? I knew they didn't want me for no comedy thing. Nobody wanted to talk to me as far as a comedian. Nobody. 
not even fucking shitty C lead labels. Wow. I finally, a guy by the name of Vic Dunlop, God rest his soul. Oh, I remember. Big Vic, time yeah. comedy, Mexican Cuban uh, comic from the store. Big time. 70s, Kennison, fist fights, stabbing yeah. Puerto Ricans, lost his leg in Vietnam. <laughs> you know, he lost like something in Vietnam, like an arm or something. Nobody knew because he had his shirt on. <laughs> Real tough guy. <laughs> Nobody knew because he had a shirt on. Hysterical. You know, again, he was a guy that if 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 I got the Soprano movie, I would have called Vic Dunlop. Vic wow. Dunlop was one of those guys that was he was the original cast member of Richard Pryor show. Wow. You know, like one yeah. of those guys. He'd been snorting coke at the store with Elaine Boozler and all Elaine those. Boozler, I remember Elaine yeah, Boozler. all those crazy motherfuckers. Yeah. I mean, he had stories forever. He had like this little side company in Vegas. If I have an album I call the Blue Album, it's me with two chicks on the cover. Mm -hmm. That's who put that CD out. God, he gave man. me the first chance. They would pay you like seven dollars a minute, so I just did like two thousand minutes. <laughs> <laughs> like they were back there with flares, they had lights giving me fucking <laughs> sirens. <laughs> I wouldn't get off. Uh -uh. I'm the seven dollars a minute. Watch me go, motherfucker. Oh, yeah. well, and seven, then he, he called 14, me. He called 14. me. He's like, we kept like fifty eight minutes. <gasps> I was on the fucking couch. I was gonna say. I'm like, All right. <laughs> so they paid you on minutes. They gave you an advance, like seven fifty. Yeah. They paid you on minutes, and then every truck stop you go to in the country, the there CD it is. was there. The CD That's was there. Great. They make that money now. They're really pushing it. Right. And now I'm not, I'm not mad at them. I won't help them push it because they won't pay me anymore. Sure. But they did give me a start. That was my first formal CD. They did a photo shoot. It was the craziest thing because it was like I taped it. They did a photo shoot, then they stopped answering my calls for six months. Hello, hello. Nobody would call me. What? Then one day in the mail, I got a box of a hundred of them, and they were like, "Good luck. That's it. You'll never see another dime again. Well, you could sell them at the show because that's what they, they gave me a hundred of them to sell them at the show. Do you know how many I sold out of those hundred? How many? Two. I threw wow. the rest away. Really? I didn't have the heart. I took them out one time in La Jolla. And, and I needed Shit. coke money really bad. Uh -huh. And I'm like, please. Oh, what were you selling them for? Uh, ten. Ten. And some guy came and gave me forty dollars, and I gave him like the ten I had. <laughs> forty is the magical number. <laughs> take them all. And take them. If you think I'm gonna stand back here and sell these things, I don't give a fuck if you take them across the street and get two dollars a piece. And then I found the guy on Sunset. Yeah. By. Uh, They do, they do pizza oh. on, on Curson, Sierra Bonita, and, Su and Su Sunset. Gaucho, not Gaucho. Oh, oh the, the, the Italian place? Yeah, uh, kind of Italian. Next door to that. Okay. Was this? Mebo's? Uh, yeah, Chibo. 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 Next door to Chibo, uh -huh. like in 98, there was this little like, half retarded guy with an eye patch. <laughs> he wasn't all there. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> <It's not bad. laughs> Something happened to him. So, like, 99 or something, uh -huh. I walked by one day. He's like, hey, you. He's not going to make class. He goes, come here. Give me your autograph. Aren't you the guy from The Sopranos? And I'm like, uh-uh. And then I tried to be mafia. I go, maybe. <laughs> you know? He's like, you're my favorite big pussy. He gave me a hug. He goes, what else do you do? I go, I'm a comedian. He goes, nah, really? He goes, you got anything to sell? So I went home. <laughs> And I went back to his thing, and I go, I got these CDs. And he goes, well, I usually take these on consignment, but you're a Hollywood star. I'll give you, like, $5 a piece. And he took, like, 50 of them at <laughs> oh, $5 shit. a piece. And I'm like, I'm never walking on this side of the street again because somebody's <laughs> going to come in here, and he's going to tell them, this is the guy from The Sopranos. And they're going to go, that's not the fucking guy from The Sopranos. <laughs> Hi. So he was, he, he's like, come back in six months. We'll sell them for 15 and we'll split it down the middle. But I'll give you five up front. He cut me like a check. I went to the bank and fucking they cashed. I'm like, ooh, ooh done. Then he went out of business. <laughs> and I never heard from him again. So. <laughs> that was a check that took him under. It's like shit. These you are the took things. him for that These, money, bro. I took him for that. You know, it was. I didn't have the balls to sell CDs afterward. But Vic Dunlop was one of those guys that, yeah. you know, Rogan is one of those guys. And when something good happens. I have to call him. I think <coughs> Friday, I knew he was in Vegas. I knew he was getting ready for the weigh-in. Yeah. And I called him. He answered. 
We must have talked something about stand up for, for like 35 minutes. Yeah. That it's a free for all. That I was listening to Ted Nugent free for all. Uh-huh. And I'm like, we're doing comedy right now. It's a free for all. Like, because I don't really give a fuck. Like, I don't really give a fuck. All I want to do is have a great hour when I go on the road. Right. That's it. I don't care about a special. I don't care about nothing. I just want to lay it on them. I just want them to leave and go, Jesus Christ, where'd that fucking old man get all that energy from? He's lying to us. He's doing blow, you know, but yeah. I'm not. I'm no. just going up there and talking, just giving it to you, biting into your fucking neck. That was all from Mitzi's death. Wow. Once Mitzi died, it took me about a month to realize what she had done for me mm-hmm. and what I had to do for her now in her honor what i have to right. do something for her and my job is to be a comedy store marine i'm that sniper that has to fucking kill you you're the guy i call and there's eight of them up there at the comedy store that right. she created and built around sebastian you know there was a lot of guys that she really guided she made snipers out of them right and we're like the last guys that come in to fucking shoot your head off like when we come in that guy's dying Right. One of these eight guys is gonna take this head off, so we're good, we're good here. Right. Like that's how funny and consistent I want to be. Like my whole mind has to be turned to funny. Like I don't even have time to get sad no more. Right. Like, if I get sad about something, I flip it into a fucking joke. Like that's how serious I am. Ever since she died, it did something to me. It was like my mother dying. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, she replaced my mother at some point in my life. That comedy store is your family. Yeah. The night I fell at the comedy store, the pain I had in my leg, you know, the thoughts about the two weeks I had to cancel and, you know, I can't lift. Nothing compared to the overwhelming love I got that night from the employees there, how they picked me up and they fucking girls were fucking carrying me and they moved my car over and they called and the next day they sent soup it made me realize i'm part of something i'm yeah. really part of something that's big it's big yeah. it's so big that it overwhelms me still after 22 years like i don't take the comedy store for granted i'm 56 and i'm still getting spots at the fucking store right suck my dick <laughs> right so when i go to st louis kansas city fucking fresno next year bakersfield i'm representing the comedy store that's it i i don't want to sell t-shirts i don't want to sell cds after a show mitzi didn't like none of that shit mitzi didn't even like selling food yeah she didn't push for the food she for didn't a long push time for the food forever just drinks. people can't laugh if they have food in their mouth she lost money so you could have a better show. A pure show. comedy establishment. Do you understand yeah. me? You know, so that's what I, when people go to me, you, you, you're leaving so much money on the table, not bringing somebody and giving them $10 an hour. Why would I want to do that? I don't want nobody to be a fucking shirt salesman, okay? That's number one. I'm not turning anybody into a shirt salesman. I'm not disrespecting a comic for damn sure and making them a shirt salesman. If, I'm, if I have to sell these shirts, I have to go out there. And that takes energy away from me for the people who pay $25 or $35 for the second show. Mm-hmm. You know what? Let's eliminate the shirts and let's give them the best show I could give them. If they want to sell a shirt, call my wife. My wife will sell you whatever. Mm-hmm. Enough money, my wife will give you a picture of a pussy with me autographed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Offer my wife 800 for a picture of a pussy with an autograph from Joey Diaz. My wife will do it. She don't give a <laughs> fuck. <laughs> <laughs> It comes in black and white, too. We got full color. All of it. Yeah. Please say that. I'm ashamed of you. Why? You never told me that Misha Tate had nude pictures. I didn't know Misha Tate. A fan of the podcast sent me nude pictures. You have to see her little pussy. Before she was pregnant or after? I don't know. It was delicious. (laughs) It looks like you ever go walk past a bakery and look at a cupcake? (laughs) Yeah. And go, that motherfucker (laughs) is delicious. Take a look at it. Push it in and show fucking Jesus Trejo. You're going to die. Hysterical. You're going to die. Somebody sent me the link, and they go, Joey, did you see these? I almost fell backwards off my shirt. There's a picture of her laying backwards, and her pussy is shaved, and it's just <laughs> laying there. And you ever walk past like a bakery and look at the donut and go, wow, wow. that's a pretty fucking donut. <laughs> it's the same thing. Her pussy pretty looks, donut. 
How pussy looks so fu- Turn on the screen. Right I have to find it first. <laughs> Google make it easy to Misha find. Tate nude. Google it and spell Misha with a capital and Tate. And make sure you spell nude with a capital. So don't think rude. <laughs> God God damn it. <laughs> I never saw nothing like that in my yeah. life. Top notch. Some guy sent it to me on Messenger. Oh. So I don't get Messenger all the time. I don't get Messenger. But wait. Top shelf? No, no, no. Wait till you see. This one picture of a pussy. Not this one. Not this one with the gagoots. Look at this, Lee. Lee, look at this. You're going to whack. Lee's turning red already. Oh, yeah. I Keep already scrolling. bookmarked it. Yeah. It's good Keep scrolling. Go. Forget this. Keep going up. Forget all these. Look at the one <laughs> on the far right. Look at that fucking cake. Look at that. Can you imagine walking by and seeing that little sand dab looking at you? Tell me you're not going to stick your tongue in there and go. Fucking submit me, you dirty bitch. Look at that. I love Misha. No disrespect. You have a... If Misha, if you're listening, you have a fucking tremendous little Pop-Tart. Right? <laughs> that is some beautiful little pussy. Look at this, guys. Look at this. It's got hair on it. Yeah, it's, it's not on the pictures. video version. We're going to take it down. The video version? No, yeah. You think YouTube lets this stuff up? Oh, I didn't know. Then take it oh, down. Damn. Look, oh, look no, at no. that. <laughs> look at that picture. That I don't like. I don't like. That's too real. You don't like that? No, I see like a foot. I could smell it. I don't like it. <laughs> look at the ass. Look at it. Farting. That's she's farting. Like it. Look at it. Tremendous Misha Tate. Fucking beautiful. I never saw it. I would never even disrespect Misha Tate. I do a podcast. I do her radio show. <laughs> the the once in a while. So somebody just sent me this. They're like, hey man, wow. you do her radio show. Did you see these nudes? When I saw that As Uncle picture, Joy would say, tremendous. Tremendous. Did you see a little crumb bun? <laughs> that little crumb bun? You're walking by in your business. Uh, you're thinking about going on vacation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you look at you were stopping the bakery window and you're like, man, that fucking apple turnover looks good. But mama's making meatloaf. Fuck my love. Fuck. Uh, fuck. Oh man! <laughs> a little digit on a bear claw. Hey, it's Monday morning. I gotta get Monday people. morning, baby. Right now people sit Rise in the cubicle. Shine. They didn't get no pussy on Monday. Fuck it. Go download it on your phone. Bang one out in the bathroom. You come out with sticky fingers. Next thing you know, the tea sticks. You know what I'm saying? You have been jerk off so much the tea sticks on your computer. It don't even. It's like capital T's for a year. Everybody's name is a T T T T T. You got to copy and paste to have it on the clipboard because you can't push the button. <laughs> ah. Oh uh, man, how is it shooting your Showtime special? When does that get released? You think? Uh, Showtime special. It should it should be like the end of first quarter next year. So I think like March, end of March. Okay. You so, excited about it? I'm excited, man. I this is a big dream come true. I mean, since I started comedy, that was like, you know, you dream of having a special, and you know, it came a little earlier than I expected. You know, 13 years in, I thought maybe it was gonna be a little later, but it's like I'm happy it's 13 here. years. It takes you seven to become an attorney, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's like it, it takes a while to find your voice, and it was just like, all right, well. I can't pass up the opportunity. I I I, I gave it my best shot. Uh, I would go down to the WeWork spot. I got a little WeWork community space, the cheap uh, thing. I would go down there. People would leave the office after five, so I get to use all the whiteboards, and I'd write up the whole set from left to right, the whole thing, and just to get ready before every weekend. I do that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday before every weekend. I would go on the road to get ready, and I just broke it down 20, uh, 20 minutes at a time. And um, I just took it very serious. I, there's nothing fucking getting in the way. It's so crazy. Like Nothing just, got in the way, man. It's so crazy how I lived in a building yeah. in 2001. I lived with Ralph and May. I lived with Ralph and May and a bunch of people in this building. And they would have little parties and stuff. And it never really, like I said to myself, I didn't come here to go to parties. Right. I didn't come here to go to barbecues. I came here to basically get on fucking stage. What's that? That's me. I would just write the whole fucking thing down. I was. I. I. I it looks I, like a beautiful mind sort of thing. Yeah. I would get obsessive, you. man. You look like fucking Matt Damon in that movie about Boston <laughs> when, he, when he does the math work. Oh yeah, yeah. With the suicide kid, with Robin Williams, <laughs> whatever his fucking name is. <laughs> Good will hunting <laughs> the suicide kid. Uh, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> It's Monday morning, people. It's Monday morning. Wake up, y'all. You got nine fucking shoplifting days left, and I can't make a fucking off-color joke (laughs) about suicide boy number one. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> but yeah, Showtime special coming out soon. It's uh, the name of it is uh, Stay at Home Son. Catch that, bro. What is it? Uh, Stay at Home Son. Stay at Home Son. Yeah. You tight with your father. Yep, tight with my mom and dad. You know. You live with them still? Yeah. You yeah. bad motherfucker. You, you yeah, saved man. on rent. You said fuck this bitch. No, no. I'm, Thank I'm, you. I'm... Thank you for listening to your Uncle Joey. I've been telling people forever. <laughs> listen, do me a favor. There's nothing out there. <laughs> I wish I could help you. I wish I could top that. I wish I could give you better advice. If your mother and father are still alive, go over there one day to eat and tell me you want to look at the basement. <laughs> that you think you're looking for a trophy and just paint it, put a bed down there, and move in. Just tell them I'm moving in. They're going to argue. You cannot move in. We told you you're a grown man. I don't give a fuck. You're not getting me out either. Uh, Mom, come here. Let me talk to you. I'll give you this. I'll help you do the laundry. I'll do this for you. <laughs> I'll you do the laundry. No hose in this motherfucker. You know I always respect you. <laughs> Move home with your parents. Save the fucking 1800 It's no fun having a roommate. And trust me, <laughs> living with a butch, bitch ain't no fun either. She's a broke bitch. You're going to end up paying double. She's always fucking broke. She can't pay the phone bill. Mind your business. Fuck chicks and cars and live with your parents. <laughs> and the Too cars. Much. Yeah. That's fuck the move, in, huh? That's Good the joy? move. Just fuck them in cars, public oh, yeah. bathrooms. <laughs> public bathrooms. You. You, you moving with your parents, bro, you'll find a way to fuck people outside. And yeah, they'll yeah. go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get creative. When, when you need pussy and you live with mom, you'll fuck a bitch in, under the garage. You understand me? Like. Why not take some of that money you save to get a hotel for one night? Because you're too cheap. You're living like a doctor. <laughs> my mom fucking turns that pillow shit up at me. If I, my mom was still alive, I'd have like a little bell next to me. When I get in bed at night, I just ring it. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. And she puts the blanket over me. And, sana colito rana. Si no se sana hoy, se yeah, sana, sana mañana. Sana colito rana, yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, Isn't that weird? Live <laughs> with your fucking parents. Do not leave. There's nothing out there. Oh, I want to go to California. Listen. You know what California is? Eighteen hundred for a studio apartment. Oh, I Plus go, utilities. I want to go to New York. Yeah, you're gonna get. Uh, what's your budget? Eighteen hundred. That's three rats <laughs> and a one bedroom. No, that's three bat. That's three rats in Brooklyn in a studio apartment, in a basement apartment, and you're gonna freeze. Yeah. Stay at home with your mother. I don't care if you live in Iowa, <laughs> Dubuque, Montana. Stay there. Build your own little comedy community. If you build it, they'll come. Yeah, that's real. Look at all these uh, comedy festivals everywhere. It's like there's a if festival you everywhere. Build it, they'll yeah. come. Comedy is alive this and comedy kicking. scenes everywhere. You right know, now. everybody wants to do this and get themselves in a fucking predicament. And you know what? This career is tough enough. You're right. Comedy is tough enough. It's... So anything you could cut out of your life that will give you keep low head low low overhead, so you could live on nine hundred a month. You know, when nine hundred is like, and you're living like, so what's the guy on Gilligan's Island? The Howells, remember they were rich? Oh, the rich, yeah. Mumphy, huh? you know. Yeah. <laughs> when you make 900 and you call them bitches Mumphy, <laughs> that's when you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, your tax returns, like, I made 9,600. <laughs> All you do is show up and they'll give you food stamps. Right. But you're living at home with mom. So yeah. you're like, I don't need no food stamps. 9,600, my car's bought and paid for. You got one of those old Toyotas, you drive oh, it by yeah, sound. Yeah. You know, you got the general, 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 $60 a month. You just right, got right. basic coverage. $30 you, a month. You a dollar over a Mexican, day. you got to leave the country. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got basic, <laughs> basic, basic coverage. Yeah, man. You know, uh, it's it's weird. Stay at home. Trust, that, I don't give a fuck. Don't tell me about your stuff. Well, if I can move to New York, right. I'm going to have stage time. Yeah, you're going to live with three fucking stinky dudes, and one of them is not going to have the rent every month. Right. Stay at home. Comedy does teach you that. I, I will say it makes you really smart with your money. Uh, it, it teaches you how to keep your overhead real. low, 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 because you know, you know, they're nothing. You know what I used to do? I, well, I, I still have my 24 hour fitness, but I knew that I needed a gym membership and you pay the extra uh, 10 bucks to get it at $45 a month. I, I would fly in to do colleges. And so there's a 24 hour fitness near every major airport in the country. That's a fact, right? So you fly in uh, to whatever Kansas City. You're about to go do a gig somewhere. You go in there. You take your morning deuce, work out, shower, go do the gig. You come back. You spend an extra ten bucks on the on on the on the rental of the vehicle. So it's like a SUV. You can sleep in there. 
You go back to the gym, work out, shower up. You return that, and you just saved yourself a, a buck fifty on a hotel. I mean, I used to twenty four hour fitnesses were my go to. You were broke, but you were in shape like a motherfucker. Yeah. Back then, I, I, when you're a, broke, a, a little, little boy. <laughs> I used to live in an office and I had no shower. Yeah, so I had to join the gym. Yeah, and I'm a clean dude, so I'm on a two shower minimum a day. You yeah, know what yeah, I'm saying? yeah, never mind three. But I just wouldn't go in there and shower. You just can't go in there and go no, to no, the shower because no. don't. You know. gotta play it off a little bit. So you gotta do something. You gotta walk get on, on the bicycle. treadmill. Yes, yeah, so I would hit the punching walk, bag in the, the morning. CNN. I would hit the punching bag in the morning and lift weights at night. Right. You know, and then take a shower. And they had Q-tips with one of those gyms. Yeah, yeah. Q-tips, blow dryer. Mouthwash. Yeah. You open the deodorant, there's like a dead hair on there. <laughs> oh. You take it off with toilet paper. <laughs> and you the daily use, double, baby. Man. Yeah. And then you would steal like shaving cream. Like they uh, would leave like a The really yeah. good fucking shaving cream edge. Oh. The one that was green and it turned a different Dog, color. I used to rob Edge from that gym on a constant guy. Every day the guy would go, we got to put a camera back there. Somebody keeps stealing the Edge. I would <laughs> How take much every- shaving cream do you need? Dog, when you're a comic, you take everything. <laughs> Just in case. Dog, I, remember, I ain't going to say the dude's name. He's a millionaire today. I still remember doing a gig with him for a weekend. And every time we'd go to eat, he'd steal every package of sugar. <laughs> That's great. Every type, the cancer sugar, the blue pack, the pink pack, and the regular sugar and the brown cane sugar, just in case. When you're on the road, you have everything in your trunk. Yeah. When my car got towed, the, my apartment, the one I lived in in Hollywood, when I would sleep in the car and then shower at Ralphie Mays, mm-hmm. everything was in there. Everything that would be necessary in case of an emergency. Flares. Right. Uh, uh, the, the, the pliers, a frisbee, a basketball, a football. I had a towel for the window. I had a pillow, you know, a set of changing clothes, blankets, and you have them tucked away perfectly. I mean, there is so much shit in your trunk that if you take it, I mean, it's perfect. You know, whatever deficiency <clears throat> the car had, right. you always prepared for it. I had a car that the radiator would blow. Okay. So I would have to put those capsules in the radiator and uh-huh. sit tight for a half hour and then start the car and it wouldn't leak anymore. It would plug the radiator. Right. It would have the little shavings yeah, the little in there. Shavings yep. in there. So you just learn all these math things and you learn about overhead. Yeah. And you start. I mean, I, I think I still have the notebook from like 98 when I was homeless. I mean, I wouldn't even file for taxes. I mean, I didn't file for taxes from 91. To 2003, and then uh-huh. I went down there and I told them the truth, and they gave me a number and I paid it all. They do because that you only go back seven years, okay? So they don't give a fuck if you made 300,000 in one year, but they'll, they'll find you. They'll, they'll, oh, they'll, they'll find they'll, you, yeah. Find yeah you. Their, their books are tight, <laughs> their books are tight, they yeah. got eyes everywhere. But it, it, you really do learn that I'm getting I'm picking up $500 this week, right? That's what I'm picking up for you know. There's some clubs that are still paying features, 75 bucks. Mm-hmm. That's real. But you knew exactly where that money was going to go. You know, it's like even on the road, it's like even if I wasn't staying at one of the nice hotels that you would stay at when you were like featuring and you're doing a one nighter, you keep your hotel cards, you know, walk in and stroll in at like 730 in the morning, a little holiday in, get your little continental breakfast, get the fuck out of there. <laughs> I mean, with a with a muffin in your pocket you and a yogurt. Here? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You got the paper underneath your arm. You yeah, got, I'm just waiting you for. You got them all under your thing, and you coming through the back. Yeah. So, so you watch for somebody to go out the back door, and you come right in, and you walk to the front. How yeah. You know? Are you staying here? Yeah. yeah. If they ask, some like most times they didn't ask because they because they can't. You know what I mean? But you're there, and in case it's like, are you are, are you a guest here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, how's your day going? You know, real friendly. Uh, um, great. Oh, uh, sorry. Have a great day. Oh, I got thank nailed you. one time. No way. Yeah. They asked me what room I was in. I said, like, 631. It only goes up to 400. (laughs) (laughs) That's how they got to. They let me eat. Uh Uh-huh. They let me eat. The older, they let me get nice and fat. And then the the hotel manager came over, and he goes, what's your last name? I go, Diaz. He goes, "Uh, we have Mackenzie in 631. Are you sure that's your room number? Let me see your key. This hat, this was at a... Marriott, like those, I forget what it's called. I got married at one of those, those Marriott. It wasn't a marquee. 
it's the those extended stay joints yeah like one of those mm-hmm. there's one in boulder i got married at marry a courtyard oh courtyard courtyard, courtyard yeah. marry okay yeah one of those where they nailed me i still remember being one behind i still remember living behind one in detroit wow and the guy was because after a while you like i said the universe takes care of you mm-hmm. okay so you go to the gig you know like i told lee some nights you go to a gig you pull up on a thursday you get in there, and the guy says to you, where are you going to stay? I don't know. I'm going to find the hotel after this. Don't worry about it. My mom's got a basement. Come on over there. Let's go eat. You're like, right. <gasps> what? What? But there's sometimes, you you know, two out of 52 weeks, right. you're going to go somewhere, and nobody's going to talk to you after the show. Right. And you're like, I got $125. The room is 80 What's the play here? Yeah. What's the play here? I got a gig tomorrow night. I could live it in the car. I ain't that cold out. I could go get a nice steak. Yeah. Maybe you get something nice. You know, like, and I'm not talking about a, a, a nice steak. I'm talking about a sizzler steak. <laughs> right, right. You can still smell uh-huh. the hair on it. Like, the guy's <laughs> hair is from his leg. Is a norm the steak. Meat. You know what I mean? Yeah, like a norm steak. Like, yeah. you can go get one of those. Then you go back to your car. Like, I still remember all those times. Like, yeah. Like, I, I remember one time we were on the road. It was... Again, Kyle, Kyle Ray and I, so we stop in uh, Boulder, Colorado, right? We got no money, uh, which, by the way, we didn't even have money in Chicago to get through the tow road. You know how you throw the change in the basket? We're digging in the cushions. I mean, we're throwing at it to see if it opens. Just penny here. Finally, it opens. We're like, we're good. We do the gig. Now we have money, right? So we got a hotel room. And then I think it was going to be our second day. We are really tired. He's like, hey, man, I, I'd like to... You know, go at a hotel or some rest up. We can shower, blah, blah. We'll split it. Great. 80 bucks, you know, for the room. He finds his spot on his phone. We go in there, and the guy, you know, smoking a cigarette inside. Sketchy, sketchy spot. So we get the room for 80 bucks. We go around back. We go in there. We open the door. There's a dog in there. There's some, like, swim flippers on the ground. And there's a lit cigarette in an ashtray in the room. Kyle loses it. He's like, what the fuck is this? He slams the door. We go downstairs. Like, hey, man, you gave us a room and there's a dog in there. He's like, what the fuck? There's no dogs allowed here. He's like, oh, you're worried about dogs? There's other shit going on here. You're worried about a dog. And he's like, uh, well, well, we can give you an, uh, another room. He's like, I want my money back. He's like, no refunds, man. He's like, you motherfucker. Cusses him out. So he gives us another room. We stay the night. And he's looking at these reviews. And one of the reviews was, hey, Look underneath the bed. There's uh, 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 one time I found a, a used needle, full on needle, blah, blah, blah. So we're like looking, we didn't find anything, but it was bad. The doors did not lock, right? And he was like, you know, upset. So we shower up, we get ready, we sleep with our clothes on because this place is so sketchy. If shit happens, you know, we're covering ourselves with the blanket, feet out just in case you got to jump up. And he was so scared. He's like, the door doesn't lock. I'm like, fuck it. Let's just sleep. We put a door up against the door handle of the door. I'm like, look, if somebody opens the door, this thing will tip back. or make enough noise. We'll pop out of bed. So we just sleep. We're fucking in our clothes. He's in his bed. I'm in my bed. We sleep. 6.30 in the morning, Uncle Joey. 6.30 in the morning, the chair. Boom, 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 boom. We're both on our feet. Wait, what the fuck? Kyle runs to the door because it doesn't close, but you put the little chain on there. So it opened up this much. And if they would have pushed a little bit, that thing would have came right the fuck up, right? So Kyle runs to the door and the door's open this this much. He just starts yelling. I don't know what he's yelling. He's just like, wah, 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 kind of barking through the thing. And you just hear a step. Da, 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 da. And uh, he like opens it and we both pop out. It was a cleaning lady. Poor little cleaning lady. He's like, let's get the fuck out of here, man. We we're already dressed. We just got our bags, got in the car and kept driving. But that was the most miserable stay ever. In and Boulder. Boulder, Colorado, oh, man. I wonder where the fuck you stay. It was a little motel off the Yeah, off the road somewhere. It was it, it was bad and it, and he's like, Man, that was the worst eighty dollars spent. But we paid forty apiece. It was it was crazy, man. But those stories are great. I I I you know that what you explain to people is that all those stories involve problem solving. They involve problem solving and disappointment. (laughs) Lots of it, yeah. So (laughs) once you get that 25 times in two years, Uh 
once you get deeper into this, they don't seem as bad as what they really are. Right. You know, like I lost an eye. Well, fuck it. Last week I lost an ear. You know, like right. Uh, you are not surprised like, you're by not any surprised by anything no more. And that's what I explain to people. That journey toughens your skin. All that stuff toughens your skin. You know, you get to a place. Sorry, there's only one room. You have to stay in the room with the feet. You go in there, the fucking his feet stink. He's smoking Marlboro Reds. You go to your car. You know, you know mm -hmm. you're gonna fight with the kid and tell him not to smoke or whatever. It, that all that stuff toughens you up for later. Right. When that movie guy tells you, no, you didn't get the movie. Right. You know, all those little things, because they're big things. When you first start in comedy, right. and you look at the itinerary, and you got to drive 12 hours in between gigs, you're like... For a $100 spot, you're like, I'll yeah. do it, but fuck. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Well, all these things prepare you for later, for the right. disappointment later, so the disappointment isn't that intense on you. Yeah, and that's the difference, going back to the thing, it was like a lot of comics are pussified, you know, like you were saying. It's like when somebody's like, hey, man, you know, your spot got canceled at or or you're going up at one thirty in the morning. Like, fuck. It's like, really? That's what you're choosing to get upset about? I got other upset. Shit. I'm not going to lie to anybody. Yeah. I got upset one time at the store. Like there was one time when things weren't going great. Yeah. And I got really frustrated and I go, fuck. I got to wait because I think it was a one o'clock spot. Mm. Like I was so used to 1245, 1230. Now it's one o'clock. Fuck. And I go, you know, I think I'm just going to stop calling up here. And they said, right now, take that, take a billboard, not a billboard, like a chalkboard, uh -huh. and put it up outside and tell them you have a 115 spot at the store and you don't want to do it. See how many people sign up. And I was like, I get it now. Touche. Yeah. And that was the last time I complained about time. You're there. You're there. Yeah. You're there. That's great. Yeah. Okay. You're a comic. You're not supposed to just be home till two or three. One anyway. of those. All right. Let's two get or to three work. anyway. If yeah. you're getting home, you're not doing it right. <laughs> right. Two or three anyway, because you and your guys got to go out and eat afterward and talk. Right. About what happened. Yeah. You bombed tonight. Yes. No, I didn't. That joke Fuck. worked. Fuck you. No. That's yeah. part of. That's part of the gig. The gig. Yeah. That's part of the night. What was your go-to spot after a show? Like where you would like meet up with when I first got here? Yeah. What was the hot spot? The hot spot after after the show? Santa Monica uh -huh. and Fairfax. Past the acting school in the middle is a 7-Eleven and there used to be a uh -huh. oh. a little fucking Photoshop place. That's where the security hut is. But in there there's a Mexican restaurant. Where the key shop? Yes. Yes. Okay, I know exactly. That's a gas station's right there. Right. Now. Yeah. Next, they used. But to there's a Mexican spot Mexican there. spot now. Now it's really bad, I think. Okay. But when you're a regular in the beginning, and that fifteen, yeah, is fucking gold. Our big thing was to go down there and sit there till three, and the Mexican lady would chase us out, and that's how I got fat. I would sit there. And she had like grape juice. <laughs> And she would just give me unlimited, like, I drink 12 grape juices. I just drank 25 Coca-Colas at the store. Yeah. You know, I just really drank 19 Cokes at the store with a lime in it. Last night? No, no. Oh. This is no oh, day. Oh, sure, sure. You know? uh -huh, yeah, then, yeah. You know, that was part of the, that was part of, so we would go there. I was never a Norm's guy. If Rogan would take us out to eat, we'd go to Standard. Oh, shit. And get the blue cheese burger. Oh, oh that sounds great. Fucking delicious. Oh, but Rogan man. had to take yeah, you yeah, there. Yeah. That's when Rogan was like, you want for a hamburger? And you act like you weren't hungry? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> nah I'm okay. <laughs> Rogan was like, you hungry? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> the subtle nah, yeah. It's like, nah, nah. And then sometimes he found somebody to go with him, and you're like, fuck. <laughs> I just missed out on a fucking clean meal. Because some <laughs> fucking guy would say, yeah. But if he really uh, wanted you to go, he'd go, come on, just sit with me and talk with me. And you're like, oh, okay, I'll go. And the waitress would come, you want a menu? <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, you're dying inside. You can't oh, wait for them to bring chips with salsa or something. Yeah, yeah. You're looking at the waitress's fingers. <laughs> you're like, I'm fucking dying here. What about the first time oh, somebody I took you to dinner bro. and you were broke? Oh. And you didn't know. You and you're like looking assume, at those numbers. You're like, oh. You assume that they're going to pay for dinner because they're a big time headliner. Ah. And you're sitting there going, oh. And they're oh. like, order, order. And you're like, okay, I'll get the steak. And you're sitting there going, I hope. 
Oh, he doesn't give me the fucking check and make me oh, split man. this. I, those are the worst. I remember when I got the longest yard. Before they gave it to me, they called me and they said, we want to meet you at the Four Seasons Hotel in Beverly Hills. Guys, I had like eight dollars in my pocket. I get their valets, 20. It's fucks fucking June. And it's 98 degrees. It's one of those days. Like, I have two horrible audition or meeting memories. That was one of them. When I got there, and they're like, 20 to park. I'm like, 20? And I went in my pocket, and I had eight, and I had a bunch of quarters, and I go, I'll be right back. Let me go to the ATM. What a fucking ATM. There was no ATM then. I just went to some fucking place and found two hour parking. Yeah. And had to walk to the uh, to the meeting. And by the time I got there, I mean I was trying to sweat. Trying to sit in the hallway and, and they're like, What are you here for? You know, it's a fucking four season. I'm walking in there with the big daddy sweat gear on that they sent <laughs> us for free. Every fat guy in town had big daddy gear. Yeah. Steve Simone knew the company guy. <laughs> so every fat fuck had big daddy. <laughs> I wore, that's how I, when they sent me a box of clothes, I'm like, I don't need to buy clothes for a year. Yeah. I wore Big Daddy shirts, underwear, swept there, and they were thick. Yeah. So your balls sweat, your ass sweat. Oh, oh It man. was that black velour. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I'll never forget walking in there, and they're like, eat. And I got the lobster ravioli. I'll never forget this at the Four Seasons. I'm uh, looking for Sebastian, and Sebastian ain't there just in case. I could borrow 20 from Sebastian. You know what I'm saying? Like 40. I don't know what the bunch was. Yeah. And it was Adam, Chris, and Peter Siegel. And they're like, eat, munch. And I'm like, okay. And the whole time I'm like, I hope they don't go four ways. I hope they don't go four ways on this track because I got $8. <laughs> and when I saw Adam pick it up, I... Oh, the heartburn went away. Like, I was getting heartburn and shit. They're like, have some cheesecake. I'm like, that's another $22. Oh, I'm going to be washing dishes. Where's Sebastian? I'm looking for Sebastian because he was a waiter then. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking for Sebastian. Like, Sebastian, listen, if it goes under, can we put this on a tab? And I can pay you tonight or something. Like, that's how petrified I was. Ugh. There was no Sebastian. And another time, right after 9-11, they changed the whole Sony thing. Okay. It used to be that you have an audition in front of the gate 11. They would let you drive. After 9-11, they made you go that way, park, and then walk back. Yeah. And it was Spider-Man 2. It was April. It was 95 degrees. And there I am with a sweatshirt with a black Big Daddy velour warm-up <laughs> suit on. And I'm 390. That's 390 right. pounds. And I could feel the sweat dripping down my back and my oh, ass. I could feel the sweat of my back mixing with the leftover shit in my ass when your ass gets Whoa. spicy. You ever have like that spicy ass? You're like, why is my ass why is my ass on fire? And you wipe your ass and there's still a little shit on the paper. Because, a little residue on yeah, it. Yeah, like, oh my God. Uh. Fucking horrendous. Trejo, I wanna thank you for being uh for doing what you're doing. I wanna congratulate you on being a regular. I wanna congratulate you on your on your work ethic. Thank you, John. Um, I appreciate it, man. I thank you, you know, for... When I got the call that you were doing videos for these guys, I was very happy because people don't understand that it's this simple. Keep doing what you're doing. And then, you ever see a conveyor belt? You yeah. ever see, like, a Toy Story or whatever? It's like Detroit. All of a sudden, one day, you actually <laughs> fall under the conveyor belt. I don't know how many times that conveyor belt has to go around before you get off. That's your decision. Mm. It's your decision when you get on the conveyor belt, and it's your decision. Once you're on the conveyor belt, that does not mean you're in bad shape. That means you're Dean Delray, you're Jesus Trejo, you're Kate Quigley, you're Steve Simone. You're, you know, I still remember Ren is Easy when he got 20 fucking screen tests and couldn't book a TV show. Right. He was on the conveyor belt you're on the conveyor belt you worked you did the work to get into the comedy store you did the work to get into the improv you did the work to get into the laugh factory you did the work to get a manager to hire you you did all that work now you're on the conveyor belt that conveyor belt could go for eight years or it could go for 12 years the rest is up to you 
For me, that conveyor belt took like 17 years because I was a fucking addict. Uh, I was fat. I didn't give a fuck, you know. So it took a longer than others. For some people, it could be three years. For some people, they hit three years, they get an HBO special. They get cocky, and then they get back on the conveyor belt. And now they're on that conveyor belt for 10 years. They got to pay that due on the conveyor belt. So just because you got a little success and you fell off the conveyor belt didn't mean, you know what I'm saying? I fell off the conveyor belt six years ago, and I had to go back on after the RIP Netflix, and I had to go back on the conveyor belt. And then I had to decide when I got off the conveyor belt again, what did I have to do to get off the conveyor belt? This is what needs to be done. Boom, now I'm off the fucking conveyor belt. You did that. You got on the conveyor belt. Congratulations. It took you how many years? 13. Okay. Now you're on the conveyor belt. Now you decide when you get off. And it's hard work, and it takes one person to see you. Right? Mm -hmm. You're at the store. You're up there at 130. Your girlfriend dumped you. Your mother's shoulder. She slipped. She broke. You're on stage. You get off. Chappelle's going on. He tells you not to leave. You sit through his three-hour fucking set. <laughs> then he tells you you're doing the North American tour with him. You're doing 23 nights. Right. A life, your life could change in that, that quick of a thing. Yeah. So now you got the 23 nights with Chappelle. So now you have to think about it. It's not just 23 nights with Chappelle. You're going up in front of the cream of the fucking crop audiences yeah. that are paying a hundred and something dollars to see Chappelle. Your goal is to retain 5% of that audience every night. Now you have a new dilemma. You're always set with dilemmas. You're always set with dilemmas. Mm. It's not really an accomplishment. It's an accomplishment wrapped around a move. You know, Rogan's going to take you out now for a year. That's 10,000 people a week are going to see you in an arena. If you can retain 5% of that, it's 500 people. Next time you do an improv, now you call an improv and say, let me get one night. Out of those 500 people, 200 of them, their pussies are hurt. They can't make it. But 300 of them show up. You just started your fucking career mm. with 300 people. Wow. And there it is. And that, that, that's all it is. And this all applies to everything. This is not just comedy. When we talk about this, we say comedy. This applies to every to actual sure. life, whether you're an attorney, a <clears throat> carpenter, you're a union carpenter, you fall into the conveyor belt. You get to work every day, you stay an hour late, you work the overtime, you work Saturdays. One day you get made a foreman. The same fucking thing. Right. The same fucking thing. And, and what happens is, for comedy, like my religion is comedy, for some people their religion is art, like Jennifer Jones. For some people, their religion is accounting, like Bob Lillingus. Lillingus. You know, everybody has their own religion. They right. believe in it. puts a roof over your head, mm -hmm. and you believe in it, and you get better at it every day that you do it. You know, you're on the conveyor belt. Congratulations, brother. Thank you, you got so your much. little fucking show. When does the Taco Show come out? Start airing. So, Tacos Con Todo comes out on Complex. Um, the trailer's going to drop end of February. I mean, I mean, end of January, and it should be out uh, January, and it's going to be just, you know, comedy, uh, going around LA and, and looking at some of the best taco spots out here and really diving into the history. It's done in the right way, and there's some great people behind it. Justin Bolas has been putting his, his all into this project, and and also I'm very grateful for people like you who took time out of your busy schedule. How much can we out. laugh? It wasn't Bro, tough for me. Oh, you just, I couldn't me, read. You and Shab fucking I, died. Oh we died. man, we died. I was I, I was telling you earlier. That's when I knew I had to quit smoking cigarettes because I was laughing so hard. Just I mean, you were going on one of these amazing rants, and I was laughing so hard I couldn't catch my breath. There was a hot two minutes where I'm like, I'm gonna die right you now. Know, that story I told is the truth. Right now I got four flies and a weed thing, <laughs> and I put holes in it, <laughs> and I feed them. Weed and yeah. take, every once in a while, when I take a shit and it doesn't hit the water, yeah, I take like a piece of stick and I put shit in that little can <laughs> so they survive <laughs> on habitat. But they're eating weed most of the time. I cut one wing off to give them like a little. I'm like a half a Hitler. Like I cut one wing off. You know what I'm saying? Like I got my own little private fly wash. It's fucking. 
fuck those cops. Can I, can I tell you something, Lee? <laughs> Please. Bro. I saw Joey move like Mr. Miyagi. <clears throat> there was a fly on the table. He's, he's looking at it. He puts his hand up, just waits like two, three seconds, goes, pa. And you think because he has big hands, you'd think like they would fly away. He does. He gets like Mr. Miyagi. I killed bro. Him. Bro, for my life. I hate flies all oh, my life, especially when I meet. got him. You guys have to see the episode once it comes out, but I mean, I was blown away how quick you oh, were. Oh, I hate flies. That's my left hand. <laughs> you got to see my right hand. The right. Ah. The flies. And sometimes I scoop them up out of the air. Like a couple of weeks ago, a possum died in my wall. Okay. Dog, I had 300 <laughs> flies in my house no. that would gather around the window, and I'd just sit there. For about an hour and let them gather like they all they, they were like, Get a like fist full sunbathing, of bathing like fucking talking <laughs> ah. like they're mingling and my wife has a fly swatter she's an amateur she's over there pointing at him i said what's <laughs> what's the master work i got i went and got a book that bent oh okay i started taking <laughs> eight of them out of the bent. row not the first the great freddie soto had a joke uh-huh. that his father would step on roaches and he would leave them there oh yeah a that's warning. right to tell the other flies that we don't fuck around in this house. That's right. My yeah. wife's like, at least sweep them up. No, 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 no. Leave them there. So that these flies so know I'm not fucking around. <laughs> and it got to the point that every, I go, how many more days are we going to have flies? And she's like, two more because they took the possum out. And then the gnats turn into fly. I don't fucking know the whole scientific fucking whatever. For four or five days, bro, I must have killed 50 flies a day. Oh, just man. going after him. Bah, bah, bah. I would walk in, close the door, make believe I was going into the kitchen. Uh-huh. And I come back with that book flying at him like fucking Greenheart. What's his name? What's Braveheart? Braveheart. Braveheart. Greenheart. I don't fucking know. I would be smacking those. Bah, bah, bah. And oh. they would go down four at a time. And then I'd step on them, you dirty bastards. And I'd sweep them outside. Ones that were half alive, I'd take a half a wing off and burn them. You ever light them on fire? They no, go, never. <laughs> I don't give a fuck. Just a stack I hope of, you fly them of America. A lion I was going to say, Peter's going to be upset with us. Fuck Peter. They can suck my <laughs> dick, too. Anyway, you have any a website they can go to and see you? Yes. I, I, Hit I, I, me. Yeah, uh, JesusTrejo.com, my Instagram, at JesusTrejo, number one. Twitter, at JesusTrejo. Where are you for New Year's? Uh, I'm going to be at the Ontario Improv doing both shows, so please come out. No shit. Yeah, and I'm at I'm doing the weekend at Sacramento Punchline. Uh, this coming weekend, I'm doing Thursday one show, Friday two, Saturday two, and Sunday I'm back home. So please uh, please go check that out. I, 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 I would love nothing more to see you guys there. How's that, tra- Jesus Trejo? Thank you again for being a gentleman. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Being a hard worker. Thank you for being... Thank you for what you do, man. A true I, I Mexican never, you know, Mexicans don't break their back. You can throw a Mexican off a roof. You ever see a Mexican with a broken back? Never. Never. You see they don't Mexican. exist. You ever see a Mexican with a Jew gold chain and neck brace? Never. Ooh, they ain't got never. time for one. You never see a, a fucking Mexican <laughs> with a Jewish gold chain. That's what they call it. Oh, that's what they call it. I was the like, neck oh. brace. Yeah. Oh, I don't, I don't know who they are. I think they are. Is You've never seen a fucking Mexican walking down the street with a neck brace saying, I sue, I sue. No, they don't sue nobody. They ain't got time to go to court. That's eight hours off the clock. <laughs> that means they lose 50. They get 50,000 in two years. Forget it. I'll get the 50 on my own. It's got- so funny. It's just, as Mexican people, we're so stubborn. My dad, they give him a, a, a neck brace because he had some problems with his vertebrae just from working so many years. He put it on. He took it off. And he's like, man, my neck hurts. I'm like, you're supposed to wear the brace. He's like, it's so uncomfortable. Hilarious. Put it on. It'll, it'll bring you comfort. No, it itches. It okay, itches. we'll deal with your. It's It's hysterical. <laughs> You love your parents. I love that about you. I love it, man. All day. You love your motherfucking parents. JesusTrail.com? JesusTrail.com. Yes, sir. Okay, my dates. I got a few tickets left at the Center Performing Arts in San Francisco. On the 28th, Calusa is sold out. The 21st is sold out. Then we start on the, I think, the 15th and 16th. I'm in Fresno and Bakersfield. And the 25th of January, I'm at the Tabernacle Theater. They added a second show. That's all I got for you. But before we go anywhere... The church is sponsored by Netflix's new podcast, Behind the Irishman. I've told you all about the Irishman a couple of weeks ago on Netflix. Some of you has liked it, whatever. I don't, listen, I think it was a tremendous movie. Now you can hear about how it was made with the official podcast. Listen to me. Pesci was tremendous. De Niro was tremendous. Sebastian was great. I mean, I loved everybody in the movie. The other guy, the one that was married to Laurie and Brocco that plays Angelo Bruno, he was great. On this podcast, you're going to hear from Charlie Brandt, the author of I Heard You Paint Houses, 
Find out how he uncovered Frank Sheeran's story and learn why De Niro fell in love with the book and, and how they got Joe Pesci out of retirement. Get an inside look at all the tricks they use to de-age the cast for all you little Comic-Con nerds and whatnot. <laughs> Behind the Irishman is hosted by a member of the church family and one of my dearest friends. I wish him all the luck in the world. In fact, he's going to be at the forum January 11th. Sebastian Maniscalco. That's He's right. hosting Behind the Irishman. So do me a favor. All three episodes are out right now today. Spoiler alert. Listen, watch The Irishman on Netflix before you listen to the podcast. Search for Behind the Irishman wherever you listen to podcasts. Watch the movie, then go listen to Behind the Irishman. Again, my main man Sebastian's on it, so you're going to enjoy it. If you want to listen to The Irishman, that's all great and dandy. But right now you're sitting there thinking about what to get for people. Don't give them a fucking gift card. I know Russians right now on a computer stealing off the, all the money off your gift card. That's what they do all day long. All day long is steal money off gift cards. Everybody has an asshole. Everybody deserves the gift of tushy. Wiping your butt with dry toilet paper. Come on, what are we, fucking caveman? It removes the shit, but it leaves the staminka juice. You ever come on your girlfriend's foot and you take the, the cum off? But the foot is stained like she's like like it's bleached. Like you ever saw those people with the purple bed marks on their faces and shit? It's the same fucking thing. Water cleans better than dry paper. I like the idea that this is written down on the paper somehow. No, it's not. This is me talking to you motherfuckers. Listen, Tushy is a fucking portable bidet. It connects right to your <laughs> toilet. It takes you 10 minutes. Oh. You don't even need... I think you need like a wrench Fuck. or something like that. No plumber, no <laughs> nothing. They start at $79, all right? <laughs> you get a 90-day guarantee, 60-day guarantee. It don't matter. I've had one for oh. four years. If my big stinky ass hasn't fucking fucked up that tushy, your little skinny bony ass will be fucking tremendous. You're like, Joey, why a bidet and why tushy? Why? Because it sprays water directly into your fucking asshole. Think about nice warm water going into your asshole. How would you feel? You're going through a rough time. Your grandmother died. They left you the patio furniture. Forget all that. (laughs) Think about getting hot water sprayed up your asshole. Who's better than you? You know why you need that? Because all day long you're sitting there like a mook with bacteria growing in your asshole. And that creates nasty things like hemorrhoids. In fact, I popped mine yesterday. Oh, oh the day Tuesday, I went to lift some weights and fucking, I heard a little, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I went to wipe my ass, there was a little blood. Thank God I had tushy. <laughs> <laughs> so no more hemorrhoids, no more yeast infections, no more UTI, but most importantly, no more itchy assholes. Listen, there's nothing. Listen, I'd rather do 10 years in jail than have an itchy asshole and no arms. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Look, can you imagine having no arms and having an itchy asshole? You could always get somebody to scratch your back. You'll die before somebody scratches your asshole. Not even your mother. Your mother will look at you and say, you're fucking retarded. Anyway, listen, oh. go to hellotushy.com right now. Oh. Press in church. And get 10% off your order. Listen, oh, there's nothing man. like a tushy bidet. I know you got people that you need a present for. This is the best present. Oh, you know what? Fuck. They start at $79. So give it a shot. Take a chance. Columbus did. Go to hellotushy.com and press in. Church. And get 10% off your motherfucking order, all right? You never used the tushy. <laughs> now is the best time. Start the year with a clean asshole. <laughs> You've never done that before, you filthy animal. <laughs> I'll see you guys Wednesday. You got nine shoplifting days before fucking Christmas. Thank you, Jesus Trail, for coming on. Thank Thank you, you, Christ Killer. But most importantly, thank all you motherfuckers. And don't forget to look at Misha Tate's pussy, (laughs) especially that up close one. It looks like a little, it looks like a little bagel with no locks. Looks like it look like it look like an everything bagel. You like when it's got everything on there, a little hair, a little stubble, a little everything. (laughs) Kick this fucking mule, Lee.